All right, good evening, City of Temecula. Today is Monday, May 9th. It is 6 p.m., and I am Chair of the Community Services Commission. I'm Catherine Sizemore, and I am calling this meeting to order. Let's begin our meeting with Commissioner Hawks leading us in the flag salute. Would everybody please rise and join us? Thank you, Commissioner Hawks. All righty, let's start our meeting with a roll call. Would our Commission Secretary, Tracy Quartz, please do the roll call. All right. Commissioner Hawks? Yes. Commissioner Kerstevsky? Here. Commissioner Levine? I'm here. Chairperson Sizemore? Here. All are present with the exception of Vice Chair Adi. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tracy. And Tracy, do we have any public comments tonight? No, we do not. All right, thank you. Then we will dispense with the reading of those rules and move on to the next part of our meeting, our division reports. And it looks like tonight presenting division reports, we have Chris, Cassandra and Willa. Which one of you will be beginning first? All right, thank you, Cassandra. Take it away. All right, good evening. My name is Cassandra Hargett, and I'll be presenting the first part of the division report. First, we have aquatics, a hiring update. All 25 lifeguard candidates who participated in the lifeguard tryouts on April 3rd qualified and were hired. May is our water safety month, and to celebrate the team, celebrate, the team will be highlighting water safety tips on social media platforms throughout the month, in addition to a water safety event on Friday, May 27th. First five scholarships have returned for another summer, providing 50 swimmers with free swim lessons. Applications open on April 27th, and over 45 applications have already been received. Representatives from Aquatics, the EOC, CAL FIRE, and Temecula Valley Hospital provided a large-scale sidewalk CPR event at Great Oak High School in April. Approximately 400 freshmen participated in this assembly and were given the opportunity to do hands-on compression-only CPR and stop the bleed training. Contract classes. A variety of contract classes were offered in April, including bear cub, pickleball, Hawaiian dance, art classes, scuba, and so much more. The summer fall 2022 activity guide is complete and viewable on the community services webpage. Guides will be in the mail soon. Registration for this season will open at 8 a.m. on May 16th. The Temecula Skate Park held another successful scooter jam event on April 9th. The city partnered with Neighborhood Drop-In and Scooter Zone donated prizes. Next event will be held this Saturday, May 14th, and will be a BMX jam event. Summer Day Camp at the CRC is returning for another summer adventure. Camp begins on June 6th, Hell is held all summer long um, through five sessions, and is designed for ages 6 to 14. Includes a variety of fun-filled recreation activities that will keep kids happy and busy all summer long. Registration also begins May 16th at 8 a.m. Teen Zone is open weekdays from 2.30 to 8 p.m. and Saturdays from 9 to 5. Annual membership is $1 and is available to all middle and high school students. April highlights include cooking homemade mac and cheese, making salsa and guacamole, playing cornhole, and human bowling and crafting. Teen Zone monthly theme box have been a popular item at the Teen Zone. April's theme was early Earthly Adventures and was centered around Earth Day. Boxes included a biodegradable growing flowers craft kit, I spy worksheet, pudding cup craft, and more. The theme for May is Spring Has Sprung. Homeless Outreach, staff coordinated with the HOT team to focus on the Temecula Creek near Cupino Lane. The HOT team deputies transported a willing homeless client to the ARC facility in Riverside. Another client was identified in April and put in contact with Project Touch. They completed the client intake process and was accepted in their men's home the same day. Six new encampment sites were identified and seven were removed this month. 
A couple highlights from this month included a collaboration meeting between outreach staff and public works. An eighth grader from Margarita Middle School made and donated 12 hygiene kits to the Help Center. And staff hosted an in-reach event at the Help Center that hosted six organizations and 18 clients received lunch, coffee, and backpacks filled with hygiene kits. High Hopes participants attended the nutrition workshop held on April 1st. They cooked a delicious and nutritious Greek meatball meze bowl that included veggies, whole grains, and turkey meatballs. For dessert, they made their own perfect bar to enjoy after dinner. The annual Skip Easter Egg Hunt was held on April 9th at Friendship Park, and over 50 participants enjoyed this event. YAC assisted with preparations for the Skip Easter event and the new Inclusive Social Skills Program at Friendship Park. The new Inclusive Social Skills Program at Friendship Park is intended to provide a safe, integrative, and stress-free environment where families and children with disabilities can play and socialize with one another. This program was held on Wednesday afternoons in April. Mary Phillips Senior Center hosted the Spring Bonnet Luncheon on April 14th. Seniors were served an appetizer of spring salad and strawberries with a homemade balsamic dressing while enjoying a performance by the Senior Center Choir and special guest, special guest Superintendent Barnett. Seniors took an excursion to the flower fields in Carlsbad via the Human Services Shuttle. They enjoyed a pleasant day surrounded by fields of flowers including the butterfly garden, sweet pea maze, and sea of sunflowers, and more. April highlights for the library included 48,844 circulated items, in-person programs such as Author Fest, 20 story times, the legend of St. Patrick's Day, and a rubber duckies contest. This month's display included National Library Week. Playoffs will start for the local recognized youth leagues at the end of this month. The City Softball League will have signups on June 7th, and the City Adult Basketball League will begin registration on May 31st. The annual Memorial Day Baseball Tournament will be held all of Memorial Day weekend and will be hosted by Triple Crown Sports. Kent Hindergart Memorial Park has had a restroom building roof rehab that included replacement of tile and wood. This includes the first portion of the report, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Cassandra. That was a very thorough report. We appreciate that every month. So let's go ahead and take our uh, questions from our commissioners, and we will start with Commissioner Levine. Hey, Cassandra, great report. I have no questions. All right. Commissioner Krzyzewski? Thank you, Cassandra. Just one question. What is human bowling? <laughs> how, does it, how does it work? I'm not so certain. I, I also have no idea. I'm going to just. Hopefully, just there's a that. liability waiver with that one. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Hawks. Thank you, Cassandra. No question. All righty. I guess I'm the only one who has questions. Uh, my, I have a question regarding the aquatics. Um, you stated in there that we had a scholarship from First Friday and that we had people applying for the scholarship. Uh, my question is, who is deciding who gets scholarships? Do we have a basis of, how are we deciding who we're gonna award the scholarships to? So that's the first five scholarship program and that's funded um, with a grant through uh, Supervisor Washington's office. Okay. And essentially it's, it just sets the parameters of age, you know, children under five years of age who are eligible for given type of uh, swim, beginner swim lessons. Mm -hmm. And it's just a first come first serve. If you meet okay. the criteria, it's first come first serve until it's exhausted. Okay, how are you um, advertising, making sure that people know about this opportunity? Um, it's on our aquatics webpage. Okay. I think if we put it in the brochure on the swimming pages too, although I'd have to double check that. Sound good? Oh, Bay is saying yes. I don't think it's in the activity guide because okay. it's usually the way the timeline goes and there's so many limited spots that we mm -hmm. offer. Um, it's advertised mostly through our website. I believe they also did some advertising on our social media, if I remember mm, right. Yes, too. and they put it out on flyers at the CRC as well and at the Aquatic Center. But it started, I want to say it started maybe four or five years ago. It was okay. pre-pandemic. 
and every year it's grown. So okay. every year it's we've filled every spot and it's extremely popular and then we just work with the supervisor's office and whatever they're willing to fund, we're able to expand. Okay. So it's it's been a very successful program and it's part of our overall um, focus on aquatic safety and drowning uh -huh. prevention within the community. Okay, I just wanna make sure that that information is getting out there to, to those that, that need to yes. need that help. Uh, also, uh, the summer day camp, are we back to full occupancy numbers pre-pandemic, uh, our ability of who we can accept? Very close. Very close, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're taking 48 per session, which is, I believe, almost exactly what we took before. I think the first session were a little lower due to staffing overlap with getting the summer started. Okay. But um, yeah, the rest of session two through five is pre-pandemic awesome. numbers. That's great to hear. And on Ronald Reagan's sports park, the bathroom snack bar renovation, do we have accom alternative accommodations for the public during that time that that restroom's unavailable? Yes, we're gonna be bringing in portalettes. It's, it's one of the CIP projects, okay. so engineering is, they're really all over it. They're very, very good at that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you answering those questions. All righty, now for the next. That would be me, Will right. Augustine. Let's get started. All right, we're gonna start with art gallery showcases. The galleries were busy in April with exhibits from artists Susan Diarmond, Sydney Edmond, Richard Allen May III, and the gallery at the Merck reception featured artists Barbara and Bryant Nelson. The arts and culture team hosted the Temecula Valley Unified School District's art reception at the CRC with 100 guests in attendance. Let's see, scrolling down to community outreach. The outreach team was busy on social media with eight reels, 15 posts, 12 stories, and 292 new followers. The team also completed the 2022 State of the City video, highlighting our homeless outreach team's effort, efforts, as well as completing Temecula Alumni Series and a short clip to promote Temecula Culture Fest Stay tuned for an upcoming episode of Around and About Temecula and Park Adventure Series. Hopping over to oh, special events. In April, the special events team was happy to host the annual Easter egg hunt and celebrate Arbor Day with successful tree planting. We ended the month with the Temecula Rod Run, which was our most successful car show to date. Now mark your calendars for upcoming Culture Fest on May 21st the Memorial Day Observance on May 28th, and National Trails Day on June 4th. Dancing over to the theater. Temecula Presents had four shows in the month of April, which attracted a total of 836 patrons. Whether it be legends, classical, or big band, there was a show for every patron to enjoy. Temecula Valley players joined us for 10 performances of Some Enchanted Evenings, the songs of Rogers and Hammerstein, which entertained 938 patrons. We also had a one night only fundraiser, The Bard Goes to Broadway by Shakespeare in the Vines and Fine Arts Network Theater Company patrons. Let's head over to the Merck. For the month of April, 13 shows were featured at the Merck, including jazz, Country, Classics, Speakeasy, and Stand-Up Comedy. Country Live at the Merck featured the Temecula Road on April 16th, followed by Stand-Up Comedy with Armando Anto on April 30th. Oh, that was a great day, my birthday. Next slide, please. Let's visit the Temecula Valley Museum, shall we? On April 8th, the museum installed their original exhibit, History in Your Pocket. This exhibit runs through June 12th and encourages guests to explore the impact the smartphone has had on all sorts of inventions. The museum also hosted Old Town Walking Tours for Temecula Elementary School and the Temecula Valley Women's Club. The Temecula Valley Museum proudly announced winners from the 19th annual third grade history contest. Students were awarded medals and certificates for their projects. On April 9th, the second Saturday cultural celebration explored Argentina with snacks, demonstrations, and crafts. 
This Saturday, we'll be celebrating the country of Guam. The following Saturday, join us for the Art and Craft Bazaar in Sam Hicks Monument Park. Vendor applications are still being accepted for this event. Lastly, save the date for May 24th. We hope to unveil a new student art mural and we'll send an official invite once confirmed. And that concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Devola, for your delightful and lively report. I appreciate it. And now to take questions from our commissioners, we will start this time with Commissioner Hawks. Thank you, Willa, for the report, and I was happy to see you at some of those events. And I have a question about the social media. So uh, with all those, do I need to subscribe? I've seen some of them, but where do I get to view the stories, the reels? Most of the um, reels are on Instagram, so it's at Temecula Parks and Rec. You can also follow Facebook. So there's a City of Temecula account, and then there's a Parks and Rec account. So you would want to follow both. Both are active. Uh, one's run by the city manager's office, and ours is run by us. Um, Katrina and Chelsea, Mike, and Jeff, they do most of the postings. They are the creative engine, but everyone participates, and we are always welcoming um, new ideas and um, trending uh, songs and so forth. So it's great to have their ideas, but you can follow on Instagram, Facebook mostly. We also have a YouTube channel, um, and that's where a lot of the information can be found. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. I would also share uh, Commissioner Hawks on the TemeculaCA.gov website. There is um, a section that says, let, like, connect how to connect with the city, and there is one whole page that lists every avenue from how to subscribe to the email newsletters, the monthly newsletters, how to subscribe to the calendars, because the city does have like a, like a Google calendar that you can subscribe to, and then there's another page about social media that lists every department in the city and what their social medias are. So there's like, a, it, it shows like the social media for the, the museum, which, um, the theater, uh, the city, Parks and Rec, they're all there so that we can, um, I think that's a great tool to be able to direct our residents to is to that part of the website so that we can get the information directly from the city. So if you haven't checked that out, that'd be, I would recommend that to, to learn all the different, because I think when I was a new commissioner, I kind of, I stumbled upon the different Instagram accounts. So there is an area where you can go and find that. One of the challenges with social media is that they have their own algorithms. You know, each social media platform has its own algorithms for what it's going to show you. So sometimes even if you're subscribed to something, you might not see it in your mm -hmm. feed. So if you go look for it and then start interacting with it, you know, liking, liking it, commenting, sharing, those things will increase the likelihood that you'll start to see it on your feed as well. Mm -hmm. All righty, Commissioner Kostowski. Thank you, Willa. No questions. Commissioner Levine. Happy belated, Willa. Thank Although you. You're welcome to sing to me. <laughs> she spent that day working Rod Run, just so Aww. everyone knows how dedicated she is. <laughs> You're awesome. I do have one question. Um, the upcoming event, the Main Street uh, Old Town Creek Walk, um, I see that that's scheduled for three hours on a Friday. Is there like an actual walk or what's the planned event? Come on, Don. <laughs> so we're still in the early planning stages of that. We did schedule it three hours so people can either come like right after school if maybe they're not working or later into the evening if they have to work and fight the traffic, which is really the only reason it's scheduled for three hours. <laughs> cool. Because I'm going to pitch it as, hey, let's show up and then have an early dinner in Old Town Temecula. Yes, exactly. Tell all your friends. I will. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Levine. I just have one question. Only one. <laughs> uh, June 4th, you had a listed National Trails Day. Do we have an event or something that we're planning for that day? 
Yes, so we'll be hosting National Trails Day. We'll send out an invite. I know we've kind of been filling your inboxes with all of our upcoming May events. They just keep getting added to our calendar. Um, we will send out an invite for that, but we'll be celebrating National Trails Day. It'll be just uh, in the morning of June 4th. We'll set up at the park and ride across from the sports ban branch at Somers Bend. And we'll just kind of meet there in the morning for snacks, refreshments, things like that. And then we'll have kind of guided bike rides along the different trails in Temecula. Okay. All righty. So I got to learn how to navigate myself on my bicycle to the park and ride. Okay. So what I usually do now is I, I email Gary and Gary emails someone else and I get a nice uh, route sent to me that's safe. <laughs> so I will go ahead and do that. All right. Thank you, guys. One, and, one, one more quick question. Yes. So Culture Fest, I know we're not technically the official hosts of that, but is there any, any previews that this team can share? Where's everybody going to be I know everything out? about it, Eric. Let me answer your questions. I mean, Commissioner Levine. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. We've known each other for a while. Um, <laughs> well, um, you did get the invite um, to be a part of the commissioner's booth. Um, so you're welcome to come volunteer a two-hour period from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. during the event. We will be having uh, two different stages with live performances throughout the day. So we're going to have um, music and special dance performances here at um, City Hall in the City Steps, as well at Stage 2, which is the gazebo at Sam Hicks Park. We'll be having um, DJ Mama Mia from KTAY uh, hosting that one, as well as some live performances over there. And then throughout the event, we will have a fun zone over at Sam Hicks Park. Um, and the museum will be open. We'll have a craft in there. We're going to have a lot of photo ops around Sam Hicks Park. So if you want to take a selfie. And then we have about, I want to say, 82 vendor booths um, spread out throughout um, the event area here at Town Square, as well as Sam Hicks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Eric. This is a perfect time to ask Willa, what exactly is the commissioner's booth? What does that entail? There's no like dunk tank or shaving cream involved, I'm, I'm hoping. So the, the goal really is to get all the commissioners together and you guys can get to know each other a little bit better in your booth, as well as answer questions, just citizens that'll be walking up and saying, hey, what commissioner are you with? What are commissions for? What do you guys do for this city? So it's really like a Q&A for um, citizens throughout the event, and as well as you guys trying to get to know each other a little bit. OK, do we get to pick which commissioners we're in the booth with during that time? <laughs> That's a great question, Don. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's just volunteer. Everyone's okay. just been kind of emailing me what hours. Um, so right now, I know we've got a lot of commissioners set for that 10 AM to 12 PM, that first two hours. So if anyone wants to come the, the last four hours, I'd love to sign you up. <laughs> OK. I think it would be great to get paired up with a commissioner from a different commission to, to get to, to learn some more about the other commissioners that are part of our city. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Do we have any more reports? Or is that that's it? That concludes our division reports, That's yes. That's it for division reports. OK, let's go to our consent calendar. We have one item on our consent calendar, which is to approve the action minutes from our last meeting on April 11th. And do I have a motion to go ahead and approve those? I move. OK, and do we have a second? Second. All right. So we have a motion from Commissioner Hawks and a second from Commissioner Kristevsky. I will take a roll call vote. Commissioner Hawks? Aye. Commissioner Kristevsky? Aye. Commissioner Levine? Aye. And Chairperson Sizemore? Aye. The motion is approved four to zero with Vice Chair Audie absent. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tracy. And now on to our business calendar. We have one item we are to receive and file a presentation on the draft of the capital improvement program for fiscal years 2023 through 2027. And who do we have the pleasure of hearing? That will be uh, Director Russo. All right, thank you. Okay, so as you know, every year we come before you and uh, bring just a, a high level overview of the CIP. 
Our CIP is really extensive. It's been funded by leaps and bounds, both at the last mid-year and in this new AOB cycle. So we're really excited, but there's a ton of stuff in the capital improvement program, so in the capital improvement plan. So if there's anything you want to dive into more deeply, let me know, and we can definitely send you, you know, project pages for individual projects. Um, eventually, the link will be available on the website. It's too big to email the entire CIP. I think the whole document was, you know, 230 pages or something. So very extensive, but if you see anything you would like more information on, you just let us know, and if I can't answer your question right here, then I will send it to you. So just as an overview, I just wanted to remind all of you of your participation in this year's budget engagement session and where Jennifer Hennessy, our finance director, came into all of the commissions and posed everybody kind of the same three questions, essentially asking them what they thought of the city's priorities, um, budget allocation, and so forth. And so this slide, which you'll also see later when you see the full budget presentation, summarizes the basic feedback that was received. And you can see in the middle there are the common suggestions between all five of the boards and commissions, which was to maintain public safety as a top priority for investment, address traffic congestion and affordable housing, and continue with ongoing community engagement. Specifically from this commission, they took the following high-level points, that the city's priorities are generally in line with the communities, um, that we should expand circulation projects to include trails, bike lanes, and active transportation, that this commission appreciates the rev that revenues exceed expenditures, and that overall open space adds to the charm of Temecula and should be maintained. This is a map, um, so if you recall in the CIP, they divide the projects into different categories. There's uh, infrastructure, circulation, parks and rec, and SARTA projects. So for the purposes of this overview, I'm going to focus just on two of those categories, which is where most of our community services projects fall. The first one is this map of parks and recreation projects. And you can see the projects listed there. We have the Children's Museum Enhancement Project, which is just an ongoing open CIP that we use to fund investments into the Children's Museum. The Community Recreation Center Splash Pad and Shade Structures, which is going to convert, those of you who might remember that shallow, small um, kiddie pool over at the CRC pool is being converted into a zero depth splash pad, which is very exciting, and we're adding some shade structures. The dog park renovation over at uh, Michael Mike Nagar Park. The Eagle Source Splash Pad Control System renovation. Flood Control Channel re Reconstruction and Repair, that's not very exciting, but it's part of park maintenance, so there it is. Harvest and Community Park Building Renovation and Expansion, which is one I'm very excited to discuss and we'll get into in a, a minute or two. And the Murrieta Creek Regional Sports Park, um, which is sort of a placeholder at this point until we solidify funding. The Pickleball Courts Project, the Ronald Reagan, and then we get into the Ronald Reagan Sports Park Channel Silt Removal, which is another one of those just gotta maintain it, you know, kind of projects. The Ronald Reagan Sports Park Hockey Rink, the skate park or um, pump track shade structure, the skate park and the restroom expansion, all of those over at Ronald Reagan, and finally the Sam Hicks Monument Perimeter Fencing, which has actually been, that project's been concluded. So going back to project number six, the Harvest and Community Park Building Renovation and Expansion. Um, if you're familiar with Harvest and Park, over by the sports fields, there's a little tiny building, it's just like a one room flat building it has restrooms on the outside, and we use it for some contract class programming. Primarily, it's been used for some of our early childhood education programming, as well as yoga and karate classes. Because we have, um, all of our facilities now are so overly impacted with programming, we've actually been losing space for our contract class programming, which is one of the biggest ways that we offer, you know, a diversity of programming to the community is by utilizing contract instructors. So this project would ask for funds to be allocated to renovate that building to roughly double the footprint and increase it to the point where we could have two to three small classrooms in there as well as interior bathrooms and a small office space. So it could truly be used as a very tiny rec center. Like it would not have a pool, it would not have a gymnasium. It would be like a very concentrated rec center primarily for contract class programming. So that's extremely exciting. We're hoping we can get that funded and move forward with that. Um, other than that, I think those other ones are all fairly straightforward. Do, does anyone have any questions about any of these specific projects? I have the project pages with me, so I can refer if you have any specific questions about them. I have a question about number seven. Sure. Is that the future park? Yes, so that's if you drive up Inez, um, just over Winchester on the left-hand side, there's kind of a big, well, you can see on the map where that is, there's a big open area. It's a floodplain. So we can't build anything 
like a structure there because that, that area is subject to flooding. Um, we submitted a, a grant proposal last year for Prop 68 funding to get funding to turn that into a sports park. And it would essentially be a bunch of sports fields because if they flood, they're fine. You just wait for them to drain and dry off and then you can use them again. Uh, we didn't receive the funding for that, but we're looking at some other funding mechanisms. So right now it's still very much in the conceptual design and development phase, but that would be a really exciting project because all of our other sports fields are overly impacted. We have more demand than we have allocation. So if we were able to secure funding for that, that would enable us to you know, develop that into a multi-sports field. I wanna say facility, but really in the sense of just a park, an open park. Thank you. Uh huh. I had a question. Sure. Um, how many of these are funded versus unfunded? Oh, you know, that's a good question. I'd have to go through and look at each one to let you know, and I can send you this chunk of the CIP. I can, it, this chunk is this many pages, so I can probably send you those. And email okay. Those. Whoops, sorry, I bumped my slide there. I was just um, curious, yeah, because I know you mentioned number seven is not funded, but you're, it's a I mean, it's it's on the unfunded CIP. So. Yeah, let me take a look at where we are. So most of them have at least a small amount of funding allocated for the design phase. So if nothing else, typically we get... Um, okay, so for that one, we're actually looking at, in the current year, we've allocated a um, million dollars from Quimby DIF for primarily for the design and environmental phase and administration that goes with it. There's um, nothing allocated in the 2023 budget, and then in 23-24, they're allocating potentially another 1.5 million in Measure S funds. And then in 24-25, another uh, five and a half million from unspecified, which is code for, we don't know where that would come from this far out. So looking at that, basically what you'd see is that we'd be undertaking design in this fiscal year and then seeing where we could get with that. And that would shape kind of the progress over the next two to three years. So this is an out year funding. I think the other reason, and I'd have to check with Pat Thomas on this, but um, I suspect the other reason that we have nothing allocated for 22, 23 is that we're still waiting to see if there might be an opportunity for grant funding for this. So if we could secure grant funding, then we can pull that funding that's allocated to Measure S, we can pull that back and start funding out of grant monies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I keep, I'm, I apologize, I keep bumping the keyboard here and moving through the slides, so. There we go. Um, any other questions on that one? Okay. And so then the other section I wanted to bring your attention to is the infrastructure projects, which a lot of times we think of infrastructure as not being community services, but in fact, because we have buildings and trails, um, a lot of these infrastructure projects actually directly relate to community services. So looking at infrastructure, if you look at that chart, the ones that are highlighted in yellow are related to community services in one way or another. So you can see numbers two through five are all related to the bike lane and trail program, various trails. Um, number six is the community recreation center renovation, which is currently ongoing. It's going to go, the CRC is going to go under construction this fall in November. Uh, nope, sorry, I think actually October, and it'll be probably closed until about May. The goal was to complete this first phase before the next uh, summer session because we really wanna be reopened for day camp and for the full uh, swimming programming. But there's uh, several other phases of that CRC renovation planned for out years as well. Then number nine is the History Museum renovation. That one's been kicked forward a couple of years so that's currently unfunded. And then number 12, the Margarita Recreation Center. As you all know, that's, that's going under right now. We're very excited about that. We anticipate that being fully renovated and ready to reopen mid 2023 roughly. Um, since that will have a pool, we're really watching that timing closely because obviously if we're trying to open for a summer, that's, you know, <laughs> that's a big deal. Um, you will see if you look at the annual operating budget that there's some staffing allocations for the MRC, but not allocated until the fourth quarter of this fiscal year. And that's because, you know, we don't anticipate opening until the beginning of the next fiscal year, roughly maybe the fourth quarter of this fiscal year, but that'll give us some time to get people staffed and trained. Uh, number 13, the Mary Phillips Senior Center Emergency Generator, that's really important. Uh, Mike Alford from our Emergency Management Department is working on identifying areas where we can become more um, uh, protected and resilient towards any future crises, and obviously having an emergency generator is really important. Number 14 is the Mary Phillips Senior Center Renovation. They're going to be closed for the second half of this year. So um, they will be moving all of the, as we mentioned at our last meeting, all of the senior center operations will be moving over to the Temecula Community Center on Pujol Street. 
uh, and that includes the daily lunches and basically every single thing except for some small group meetings that we weren't able to accommodate. Uh, 16 is another trail item, 18, uh, 19 as well, both part of the trail system. And then 23 is the Temecula Elementary School pool renovation, which is just that pool, as you probably know if you've been there, is just a never-ending pit of renovations. Um, and then finally, the Merck concession upgrade is number 25. And actually, I don't know offhand if that one's funded for this coming year, so I'll see if I can find it really quickly. That one, oh yeah, that actually has uh, $604,000 funded, or I shouldn't say funded, uh, projected from Measure S funding for 2023. So that would enable us to expand the existing concession area at the Merck. Currently, there's a lot of restrictions because when that was initially built, the, the health code has changed quite a bit and the requirements for space and what you can serve and what you can't serve have changed quite a bit. And so our concessionaire is really limited in what she's able to offer and how many people she's able to serve. So, so that would be a really great upgrade over at the theater, especially for um, intermissions and you know just anytime anybody wants to get a snack or a drink. So, so that concludes kind of an overview of the main CIP projects that are relating directly to community services. There are many other projects, dozens more projects in the whole CIP. Again, if you have any questions, just let me know and I will email you any specific uh, project sheets you wanna see. Also, I would encourage you to bookmark, I think, Thursday, let me check the date real quick. May 19th, budget workshop, somebody reading my mind? Okay, great, May 19th. <laughs> Thursday, May 19th from nine to noon in the conference center, somebody's verifying that for me, thank you, uh, is the annual budget workshop. If you haven't participated in that before, it's a really good opportunity to just see the preliminary overview of the entire proposed budget um, the executive staff is there, everybody walks through their section, Jennifer Hennessy gives an overview, Aaron gives an overview, and then the council has the, there's public comment so people can weigh in, and then um, the council has the opportunity to weigh in and provide any sort of final suggestions, requests, direction into the budget before then it gets finalized and then comes back to council, uh, I think the first meeting in June for uh, approval. So if you haven't been part of the budget workshop, I think you know I think we can trace our current pickleball CIP, which is extensive. I think it's one, up to 1.2 million now, I think. We can, I believe, trace that back to a budget workshop maybe four years ago when we had um, Ed Morell and some other individuals come in and start, start fomenting for pickleball. And next thing you know, it takes a little time, four years later, but here we are, we have pickleball. Same thing with the going back to the community services, parks and rec ones. Um, if you look over at the Ronald Reagan section, the number 12, the skate park, and number 10, the hockey rink. We can directly attribute the funding that those two are receiving, and they're extensive. One is $750,000 and one's a million dollars. I mean, those are big, big projects. And we can directly attribute the fact that these are getting funded to the fact that community groups came forward. They came to, before you. They came here to commission. They came to council. They've come to budget workshops. They participated in the community services master plan process. And it's through that community engagement, we have a council that is very responsive, that these projects get eventually sometimes you know, funded. So, so it's an exciting time. The city obviously is doing really well. Um, as Aaron often says, we're, we're very blessed uh, and fiscally we're doing very, very well. And so we're in a fortunate place to be able to fund this many capital investments. So that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll do my best. And if not, I'll email you the answer later. <laughs> All right, thank you, Erica. Mm -hmm. So let's take uh, questions from our commissioners. Let's start with Chris, Chris Commissioner Krasowski. Thanks, Erica. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Commissioner Hawks, do you have any questions? I have a couple of questions. The first one is just the hockey ring you mentioned. Is that the one next to the Mike Nazar, the splash? Pad? No, it's the other hockey rink. It's the one at um, Ronald Reagan Sports Park. Oh, there's Park. two, okay. So the one at um, Mike Nagar is in pretty good shape. The one at Ronald Reagan has had repeated problems with the surface. The way it was built, it has some expansion joints that have always kind of like caught people's wheels or they just, they, they, it was not built correctly, basically. So um, we're actually looking, this CIP would completely resurface. It would completely grind down the surface, totally put in a new surface and looking at putting a cover over the top of the hockey rink. Okay, so the other one, they're not doing anything? Uh, no, the other one's fine. It's, it's and good is there a reservation? I've, I've been to the other one sometimes. Mm -hmm. looks like they're 
they're a team there. They said they, so they reserve it? Yes, so for both of those hockey rinks, they're used primarily by Temecula Valley Inline Hockey Association. That's um, just what it sounds like, inline hockey. Winetown Rollers, which is a roller derby mm -hmm. group. Um, sometimes, in the past, it's been used by a futsal group, which is like indoor soccer, but played on the hockey rink. And I'm forgetting a fourth group, lacrosse, box lacrosse plays there. So those groups go through our sports group and they reserve the hockey rinks. Um, but then when it's not being reserved, it's just open for anyone to go play, use, mm -hmm. however they'd like. So do they, because last time I mentioned about pickleball being so popular and you said there is no reservation. So is there a difference? So people can reserve this one, they pay a fee and the other one they can't reserve? Yes, so at this point we don't, um, in order to be able to reserve anything with a fee, it has to go to council. So pickleball has never gone to council to have mm -hmm. a policy and a fee because in the past, it's fairly new, and we don't have a dedicated pickleball facility. We just have those courts at Margarita that are striped for mm -hmm. one tennis court, four pickleball courts are striped, and the other one you can bring your own nets. So um, when we reopen or when we open the new pickleball facility that's going in at Wolf Creek, that's going to have 12 courts, we'll probably have a reservation policy and a fee policy and, a, and a, a way for people to reserve that. But we're just a little behind the curve with pickleball. Most of our sports, if you look at sports facilities, any of our fields, like for soccer, um, baseball, softball, um, we do a little bit of football. Um, those fields, those multi-use fields and the baseball fields, those are all reservable. But if you look at like our sand volleyball court, that's just a first come first serve amenity. So typically things that are used by organized teams, leagues, rental groups, tournaments, rentals, we have a policy and people can rent and reserve. Things that are more like community, unstructured, fun, things like volleyball, pickleball, that type of thing has been historically um, just first come, first serve. Tennis, first come, first serve. Okay. So, but we're looking at evolving that obviously because we're going to have a really big pickleball facility mm -hmm. coming in. So 12 courts will be exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. My other question is, you mentioned earlier there is a focus to, we want to maintain the charm of Temecula with maintaining open land, mm -hmm. but also I saw a lot of building like the new park and some of the other, I looked through the CIP, there are those other housing projects. Mm -hmm. So a lot of building also going on with some other, the planning commission just mm -hmm. approved some of the buildings. So how do we balance, like we mm -hmm. want to reserve land, but also we're building mm -hmm. at the same time? That's a, I mean, that's a great question. And that's really, you know, kind of at the highest level of council and commissions and, you know, what, what the policy direction is set at the council level. Um, currently, because the city is almost completely built out, we're looking at mostly infill development, which means taking small pieces of land that are in the middle of the city and saying, what could we put in there? Could we put mm -hmm. in a store? Could we put in a small housing development? There are a ton of factors that go into that, like um, the new housing development on Inez, um, as you may have heard, was allowed to go in, and I'm really generalizing this because it's not my area of expertise, but it was allowed to move forward bypassing a lot of the usual local control steps because of a state level direction relating to affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So they're providing a certain percentage of their units are affordable housing. As a result, we really didn't have any local control over that. They get to do that development. So that's really something where getting involved at the planning commission level can really help, um, help you understand and help you shape and provide input to what kind of projects are coming forward, what gets support, what doesn't get support. The other thing balancing that, of course, is that in the crassest sense, developed land provides revenue, undeveloped land does not provide revenue. So from a city perspective, a lot of times any city, not just Temecula, they're looking for the best and highest use of the land mm. to be able to best serve the community's interest as a whole. So it's kind of a higher level discussion than my pay grade, but <laughs> I would encourage you to you know, attend the planning commission and kind of check in with them and see what sort of projects are coming forward too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Hawk. Commissioner Levine? Uh, I'm good. Appreciate the update, thanks Erica. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Commissioner Levine. I did take a look at this earlier today. Um, only questions I have, Erica, would be, um, is this, do we still have the ability to add projects in the next five years? I know we've had a lot of people requesting like an aquatics complex. In, you know, in, if, are we able to put that in? 
Is this set in stone for five years? These are the projects? No, so the thing with the CIP is it's, it's budgeting really one year out and projecting okay. the next four is okay. how I would describe that. So every single year, this year we're looking at 23 to 27, next okay. year's budget process we'll be looking at 24 to 28. So every rolling year, it's another chance to kind of look at the projects that are out there, reevaluate. Sometimes projects get pooled, sometimes new projects get added. Okay. Like in this round, we were able to add a lot of new projects. Mm -hmm. um, some projects, like I mentioned that um, the, oh, I guess it might be under infrastructure. The like history the skate park was. Well, yeah, that's a great example. I mean, the, the skate park and the hockey rink, those were very, I mean, those just really came up in the last year. Yeah. They got a lot of traction, and they got added at mid-year. Okay. That's, now, that's relatively unheard of. I mean, that's the first time I've seen that mm -hmm. happen that way. We just happened to have a year where revenues came in over expectation. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is with that five-year CIP, another part of the budget that Jen does is a five-year revenue projection. Mm -hmm. So she's also projecting out and modeling revenues five years into the future. Now, as those revenues change and fluctuate, that drives every other aspect of the budget, obviously, but especially the CIP. So let's say we had, let's hope not, but let's say we had a terrible economic downturn and all of a sudden, two years out, our revenues tank. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of these projects that are currently projected to be funded in two years, we'd be revisiting and probably kicking them off into the future or downgrading or resizing or reallocating. Conversely, let's say for some reason, revenues just have a huge jump and a spike then among all the other considerations in terms of you know, public safety and fully funding reserves would be a discussion of like, oh, can we expand one of these projects or can we pull it forward and fund it sooner? So to answer your question, definitely not firm. Okay. This is a projection and it's a rolling, evolving model that changes every year based on the latest and greatest information. Okay. Um, and also a question on uh, open space. Yes, mm -hmm. I remember last year I was talking about open space being a priority. Are, do we consider our parks as part of that open space? Um, that depends on who you talk to. Generally, okay. um, I personally don't consider parks to be part of open space. Okay. Okay. When I'm talking about open space, me personally, Nature. my bias, I'm talking about you know reserves, preserves, okay. trail systems, okay. those are open space. Um, parks are developed, not open space. Okay. Um, but I think for a lot of the community, if mm. you just use the term open space, I think a lot of people think parks. Okay. So as a citizen, not as an employee, staff member here, um, years ago I remember saying to somebody like, you know, Temecula really doesn't have any open space. Like we have to go up to Santa Rosa, uh -huh. you know, to uh -huh. really get access to open space. And somebody here, a fellow employee was like, oh, but we have, you know, 30 plus parks. We have almost 40 parks. And I thought, that's not the same. Okay. But in the common perception, I think there is this perception of we do have parks. We have a lot of beautiful oh. parks. We have quote unquote open space. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate You're quite you welcome. having this uh, session with us and answering our questions. And to put you back on the hot seat, now is time for the director's report. Do you have <laughs> more to share with us? Um, all I really have to add at this point is that our, actually, you know what, I'm going to turn it over to Cassandra. I'm going to let her share. Could you provide a quick update on the brochure? Yes. So the brochures are at the printer right now, and so we plan on having them back hopefully as soon as possible to go out in the mail. Um, but the guides are visible online, so we're trying to direct everybody to the website so that they can see them ahead of time. Um, it's beautiful. It's, the cover is bright orange this time, so you can't miss it when it hits your mailbox. Um, and all of those activities will, st well, registration will begin on Monday May 16th, so next Monday, if you are got anything that you're looking to register for, keep your eye on it, and registration starts at 8 a.m. I get in there quick, because people are ready. Okay. So, um, and then, yeah, check out the guide. They're online, and you can view them on our city website, temeculaca.gov slash tcsd. Okay, so I infer from that that we are not expecting our residents to have the brochures in hand to glance through before the uh, enrollment date? Probably not. We're going to do a big social media post. Okay. Um, there was a little bit of a delay at the printer. There was some paper shortage that we were unaware of. Um, but it's in the works, and they are working on printing it. Okay. Um, so it'll get out in the mail as soon as it possibly okay. can. Um, but we will be doing a social media post here probably in the next day or two. You'll see that. Press releases. Every way that we can possibly touch on, um, aside from 
handing them the books, we will, we will put out. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. So actually, Erin, if you can, um, I don't know if you can share my monitor for me. Yeah. Oh, I think you're we're so seeing, quick. We're looking at the cover. You're so fast. Yeah, so there we go. So just to show Alrighty. you the beautiful cover that we have. It is beautiful. I love and, that color. Yeah, and we're back up to, I think we're at 52 pages this time. So awesome. we're getting back up there in size, and it's just jam-packed full of activities. And the way you get to that, if you go to temeculaca.gov slash community, TCSD, I think, and then I just ended up here. Let me get back to where you need to go. I'll just walk you through it. Oh, it redirects, that's why, to the 316 Community Services. And then right there, that circle, it says Activity Brochure. Okay. You just click on that, and it takes you to this beautiful brochure online, which you can gaze upon until it arrives in your mailbox. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Cassandra. So that's all I have for the director's report. Well, thank you very much, Erica, and thank you, Cassandra, for your addition to the director's report. We appreciate that. The next item on our agenda, uh, our last item, is our commissioner reports. So let's start with Commissioner Krastevsky. I have nothing to report. We did participate in one of the Easter egg hunts, which was amazing. Uh, lots of people. It was great to see the community back out. At, at those events, a um, lot of fun for the kids. So thank you guys for all that you do with that. And I just drove back from Arizona, so I'm kind of tired. But <laughs> other than that, I have no other comments or questions. Thank you. I'm button challenged tonight. <laughs> I think I finally got it. Thank you, Commissioner Kristevsky. I appreciate that. Commissioner Levine, do you have a commissioner's report for us this month? I don't have anything interesting to report, but again, uh, the staff, hats off to you guys. Terrific event. Um, Rod run, 50,000 people. That's just simply amazing. So mm. I, I think we're back. And hats off to you guys. Thank you. Amazing. All right, thank you, Commissioner Levine. Commissioner Hawks. Yes, I have a couple of things to report. I was there for the Easter egg hunt. I would say that's a great success. I was really happy to see, I, rem I remember seeing a report, 2,000 at each park, participants showing up. So that looks like a pre-COVID level to me. I didn't see much difference. And I wish all the kids can clean up their room that fast. <laughs> like within a minute, the field was clean. And the second, I was at Arbor Day. I saw Willie there, Willa, Willa. And I was ready to plant some trees, but when I got there, all the volunteers were there. They already did most of the work. And so I didn't take any credit, but I want to thank them for coming out. Is that from one of the church? They come out, most of 100 volunteers? Yes, yeah, so it was Helping Hands, uh, which is from one of our Latter-day Saints uh, churches. So they planted trees at that park as well as four other locations in Temecula that day. Yes, so I, I want to thank them. Also, I want to know if other groups or like myself or my family want to volunteer, say plant some trees or what other events, who do we go to? So I oversee a lot of our volunteer opportunities with the community services department. So we're always open to any groups who want to either schedule a community cleanup every now and then we do have opportunities to paint fences at our parks or to plant trees. So between myself and our public works department, we can usually find activities and service projects for volunteers who are looking to do something. So if you and your family ever want to do something or if you have any community groups that you're involved with and you're looking to do a service project, feel free to reach out to me and we can set something up. So if you I'm don't correct, isn't there a, port, a section on our website where you can uh, get information on volunteering with the city? Yes, we do have a volunteer page that includes uh, opportunities either with nonprofits and local community organizations. And then also we do have some as far as volunteering with the community services department, our main online option for that would be through the Old Town Temecula Community Theater. 
So it just kind of depends on which avenue you're looking to go through. We do mention the Adopt-A-Park program on there, but as far as just one-time community cleanups, that's usually just some things people will set up by contacting me. So not necessarily on the website at the moment, but just all of our other volunteer opportunities are listed online. So we either go to online or email you. Yeah, I, I would suggest in this situation, feel free to email me and then okay. I'll put you in touch with whether it's something um, doing a tree planting or volunteering with our nonprofits. I'd be happy to point you in that direction. Okay, thank you. Oh, lastly, also, I want to thank the staff for changing the parade picture. I got an email from the city regarding the events that are coming up, and I saw maybe you changed the picture, but I just want to thank you for taking my feedback from last commission meeting, and then now I saw horses with riders with all the flags, so I'm very happy to see that family-friendly picture posted there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Haas. And finally, for myself, I, I did receive an email from Commissioner Vice Chair Audie who wanted me to let everyone know that May is Bike Month. And we have a special uh, event happening tomorrow uh, at City Council meeting. They will be issuing a proclamation for it being uh, Bike Month in the city of Temecula. So we do want to invite everybody to come out and support that. I know. Biking, active transportation is very important to many of us on this commission. So I wanted to let everyone know that so you can come out and support that. And I, I, I know that we did not receive the report on it this month. We're not going to hear about this until next month. But I had the opportunity to go to the Mary Phillips Center to um, participate in the Cinco de Mayo festivities for the seniors. And I just, I was so blown away. Uh, the city staff there, Yvette and her staff, they thought of everything. All right, I'll bring, <laughs> Bea, Bea didn't bring her little decorative, but they had costumes, even for me, and they, they, it was decorated, and what was so amazing was just that building was full of so much joy and love. And you could feel it, the seniors love that, love it there. I was talking with several of them that that is what they do, and they enjoy it. That's a part of their routine, and it was amazing. It was beautiful, just beautiful to witness the very personal relationships Yvette and her staff and Bea have with the seniors. They know them. They, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I was just blown away with everything that was happening there for our seniors and hearing it from the seniors themselves. And I think sometimes when we think of seniors, we think of they were quiet and slow. Not, not our seniors. Oh heck, no. <laughs> oh, heck no. They were cutting a rug and out there dancing and having just the time of their life. It was, it was beautiful. I left on Friday just, just dancing and smiling, just filled with so much joy. So I wanted to share that with you guys. If you have a chance to go and participate in any of the events that they're holding there, um, I'd highly encourage it, um, even ju just, to, just to witness the staff's relationship with the participants um, it is worth it. And I just want to commend you, Erica. You're, you're doing something right because your staff is, <laughs> you're doing it's, a whole lot of something it's right. It's entirely <laughs> despite me and not because of me. Because, <laughs> because they're just, no, they're amazing. Yvette and they her team. <clears throat> And you know, to, to operate a senior center really takes a high degree of dedication and sensitivity and um, a real heart for the work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, Bea has just absolutely invested herself as well over there and she is at every senior center event and just, you know, she gets right in there and just it mingles makes me feel and meets young and greets. To go. <laughs> <laughs> but to get to know them by name and mm -hmm. to hear their stories and to unofficially adopt them as parents or grandparents for those mm -hmm. of us who don't have ours anymore, it is an honor, and um, you know we met Wayne, who's ninety-eight years old currently. He will be ninety-nine in oh. August. We're all gonna come to his birthday party, and his um, favorite story to tell is that on opening day of 
the Mary Phillips Senior Center, he got a hug from Mary Phillips herself. And that's just, mm -hmm. you can't, you know, yeah. that puts a lump in my throat just to hear that, that he's been there from the beginning of time. He's still active, he's still alert, and he's still dancing and enjoying himself mm -hmm. every day. So mm -hmm. thank you. No, I love it. And thank you so much for sharing that, Kathy. It really means a lot to staff to, um, you know, I mean, staff do what they do because they love it and mm -hmm. regardless of the recognition, but it is still really nice to know that somebody recognizes what they're doing and, and recognizes the commitment or the commitment it takes and the impact it has on the community. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, yeah it was just wonderful seeing the, the role and the place it, it takes in these seniors' lives and to, to talk with them and to get in there and learn a little bit more firsthand about the programs and how, how it's ran. I, I didn't realize that we will pick the seniors up. We have a bus and we pick the seniors up and if you can't drive, we get you there. And that, that's, just, that's just great. That, you know, I just came home and to borrow from our, our past mayors, Temecula has heart, mm -hmm. Temecula cares, and I, I really appreciate that. So that is all I have for my report this month. And looks like our next meeting will be on Monday, June 13th. Are you sure it's the 13th? Yeah. It is? Okay. Okay. My birthday is the 14th, and I kept thinking I was here on my birthday, and I was planning how I was going to... Yeah, it'll be at City Council. Okay. Well, I won't be here for my birthday. <laughs> All right, so our next meeting will be Monday, June 13th, 2022, at 6 p.m., right here in Council Chambers. And this meeting is adjourned.